The views expressed herein reflect the views of the Whistler Agency as of the date of publication. These views may change as conditions change. The views expressed herein are not intended and should not be construed as investment advice, and they do not address any individual's specific situation. Welcome to Whistler While You Retire with Tim Whistler from the Whistler Agency. Here you will learn how Tim helps clients avoid taking unnecessary risks in retirement. With a fiduciary responsibility, Tim's mission is to help retirees and soon-to-be retirees create a greater sense of confidence about their retirement plan. Now, on to the show. Hello again, everyone, and welcome to the Whistler While You Retire podcast. I'm Tim Whistler. If you've been listening in for an episode or two, you may have heard me share how we help our clients create a strategy that is designed to protect their hard-earned savings from market volatility. I refer to this strategy as avoiding the down and earning some of the up. In fact, we talked about this at great lengths, I think in episode two of Zero is Your Hero. I am so honored to have with me as my guest today, a gentleman who who develops and analyzes the index that provide the quote unquote, some of the up in this strategy. He is the founder of the index standard, which we're gonna learn about here in just a second. He is an index advisor to Robert J. Schiller, Sterling Professor of Economics at Yale University. He has served as Managing Director and Head of Quantitative Indices and Strategies at Barclays. Before Barclays, he was the Head of Indices at ABN AMRO in London, where he successfully launched indices with investors Jim Rogers and Joel Greenblatt. He holds an MBA from the University of Warwick and a bachelor's degree from the University of Cape Town. It is truly an honor to introduce you to my guest today, Mr. Lawrence Black. Lawrence, thank you for being here today, my friend. Thank you, Tim. It's great to join you today. I appreciate you being here. I know you do this a lot, so it is truly, I hate for you to be redundant and repeat yourself, but to us and my listeners, this is an honor. So thank you again. So really excited to join you. So, um, you know, your background is just so impressive. I had, um, you know, the opportunity for us to meet, you know, just a few days ago at that advisor conference down in Scottsdale. Um, You gave a little bit of background, but would you share a little bit too, again, um, kind of fill in some of the cracks on your background and, you know, how it inspired you to establish the index standard? Sure, Tim. So my background is I spent about 25 years in investment banking of which the last 15 have been developing and designing indices. And you know, over the last sort of 15 years, what I've already seen is this complexity increase. So when I left Barclays about two years ago uh, to join Professor Schiller, I thought to myself, you know, I've designed indices for 15 years, so I'm going to design some more. And then, you know what, I took a step back and I said, there are 3 million indices in the market today. <laughs> They're getting more complex. Does the world really need a three millionth and one index? <laughs> right. so, you know, I thought maybe not, right? But then I thought maybe the world needs someone to help decode and demystify these indices because what we see today is many complex terms like mean variance optimization or risk control. Mm-hmm. So that was the key driver. You know, I really want to help people retire better and understand what they're buying. So at the index standard, we produce ratings where we evaluate indices. And, you know, you can think about us as the JD Powers. You're thinking about buying a car, you go and look at the JD Power rating. We do the same for these indices. And then there's a second point. Earlier on in my career, I was actually a bond trader. And the first thing I got told was, you want to buy low and sell high. So that always has resonated with me. Pretty good advice for anyone thinking about the markets. It comes in handy. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, exactly. (laughs) And then, you know, I kind of got into this index world 15 years ago and, and, and you see these amazing back tests that the insurance companies or the index uh, developers will show you. And basically they're showing you, look at this amazing back test. The the graph normally, normally starts at zero and goes 45 degrees up to the right-hand side. And then it's sort of buy high and sell higher. And that always kind of confused me because I got taught when I was a bond trader to buy low and sell high. So I'm like, that doesn't make sense to me. Right. So, so that's when we developed um, a forecasting tool at the index standard. And, you know, I think forecasting is incredibly difficult, but we have a, a thoughtful process where we take the wisdom of Wall Street, we marry that up with the index, uh, the index attributes, and we bring it together to have a sensible looking forward, forward um, forecast. So those are the two tools that we have today, and we offer those to clients to really try and help people uh, retire better. 
I, I love it. I tell you, when, when this was introduced to um, us there at Insuremark, and um, and I've heard your your podcast that you did with Jack Martin, and uh, of course, you know, heard you speak live, and then also doing some some research on my own. It just this is so important to us. I was kind of talking to Patrice here offline. And when I provide an analysis to people, it's always fun to to share this with them and say, look, this will cater to the person who wants to know how the clock is built while also catering to the person who simply don't, wants to know what time it is, right? <laughs> and everybody in between. And, and I love the fact that, you know, you and I get to have this conversation because, you know, like you said, Lawrence, we are too, also in that same boat. We are trying to develop retirement income strategies for clients, and I'm trying to match, you know, help them understand the importance of matching their tolerance to risk mm-hmm. to their, to how do we allocate their assets? You know, and because gone are the days where CDs could be laddered, you know, where banks were paying eight, 10, 12% and a free toaster for every CD that you bought, you know, so the life insurance company, as we know, responded and provided this solution. So, you know, let's, let's kind of dig a little bit into the weeds here a little bit, not too far, because I know when you are, you know, I were speaking, it'll be hard for us not to go that deep, but we'll keep it high level, but you know, let's talk about, you know, what is happening in the index space? You know, what, you know, we're at, you know, like you said, 300 or 3 million in some, there's so many of them out there and trying to forecast ahead. Um, so let's talk, talk a little bit about that. You know, what, what do they do right now and, and how many are we looking at? And, and let's dialogue back and forth with that. Sure. So, you know, if we go back 20 years, if you're thinking about an insurance product, you know, what you would see would be the S&P 500, the NASDAQ, and maybe an MSCI IFA, mm-hmm. which is um, Europe, uh, Asia, and Far East, or you'd see maybe the MSCI emerging markets. Mm-hmm. So you had these simple indices, stock only, market cap weighted, and everyone kind of knew how, how they work, right? Mm-hmm. 500 stocks in the S&P, pretty simple to explain, and it's got a wonderful brand that we all know. So that was 20 years ago. Roll forward now in the insurance space, we see almost 170 indices being used. So the amount of indices being used is increasing all the time. And, you know, as we speak now, I think in January, 2022, we've seen probably about six or seven coming out. So the innovation is continuing and the number of indices is is growing. And then the complexity is increasing. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I would say maybe 10 years ago, we had a feature called risk control, which is really just trying to stabilize an index that evolved. There was another technique trying to find the optimal allocation And today we see amazing stuff. Index providers are using artificial intelligence. Some of them are using intraday signals. Some of them are getting signals from satellites. So, you know, this complexity is increasing and it's getting harder for your your average person to decode them. You know, even it takes us some time. Some of these indices have rules of 350 pages. So that's what we're here to do, to really help decode and demystify them. So, okay. So I'll go back to that 350 pages for, for one index. Exactly. Right. Can you believe it? 350 pages. You know, I, I know, I know building the clock was extensive, but I didn't think it was 350 pages worth of details. It's yeah. crazy. So, you know, you said it earlier too, forecasting being difficult. You know, we're all familiar with that phrase. Um, how's it go? Past performance is no guarantee of future results, right? It's exactly. everywhere, right? Here we are with interest rates being what at 40 year lows, we came off of of an incredible 10 year run, a little bit of a hiccup in 2018. How do we forecast? How do you kind of foresee as we look into the next year, five year, 10 years down the road with with these indexes and where where we're going with all this? Sure. I mean, that's a great question. Let me break that into two parts. One, let's talk about fixed income. Then we'll talk about some of these indices. So You know, on the fixed income side, I think there's a really good piece of research from a company called Research Affiliates. Mm -hmm. And what they went and did was they went back 120 years and they look at fixed income returns. And what they found, Tim, was that there is a very strong relationship between that starting yield and if you hold that bond for 10 years or that fixed income instrument. So, you know, where, where are we today? So right now, as you said, we're, the, the 10-year yield, let's use that as the benchmark, it will hit about 50 basis points in the bottom of the pandemic. That's actually gone up to about 2% today. Okay. So you could reasonably expect if you buy some like the Barclays Ag, a very well-known fixed income benchmark, you can expect 2%. And that's roughly what we see in some of our forecasts that we use from the wisdom of Wall Street. Mm-hmm. So... 
a couple observations with that 2%. Firstly, you know, with inflation today, it's seven, but let's say that's going you know, high, it's going to come down. But even if it comes down to four or three, on a real basis, you are still losing money. Right. Problem number one. Yep. And then um, the other point is, you know, if, to your um, listeners who, who know a little bit about bonds, if you recall, there's an inverse relationship between yields and your return. Mm -hmm. So what that means is if the yield on a bond goes up, the capital price comes down. Mm -hmm. So if you're holding the, the Barclays ag, you know, and as rates rise, you can actually lose a bit of money. So that, that's the worrying thing about fixed income. So, and if you think about fixed income, in a portfolio, it used to be the ballast. It used to be the anchor. That was right. like, you know, you used to put 40% of your portfolio into the safe asset. You're going to get some coupons and you'll be fine. Yep. Now that's not the case. So what do you do with your money? And, and that's why, you know, a lot of people are gravitating towards these annuity products because you can get potentially higher yields. And as you mentioned at the, at the top of the show, the hero is your zero. So now let's look at our forecasting. So what do we see? I would say in general, unfortunately, what we see, we're in a, in a much lower return environment. From a macro point of view, the last 10 years have been a real treat for us. We have seen about an annualized 13% on the S&P 500. We've seen almost 20% on the NASDAQ 100 in terms of annualized returns over the last 10 years. It's pretty phenomenal. It is. But now if we look forward to what Wall Street is saying, the average of 25 asset managers in Wall Street, we see about 4% for the S&P. And for the NASDAQ, we see about five and a half. So, you know, returns are coming down. And that's a pretty sobering thought that we all need to get used to potentially lower returns. No, I so, totally agree. I'm sorry, Lawrence, go ahead. No, go ahead. And then, you know, what we also look at, we look at the average forecast of all these indices used in these that have risk control features. And what we see, you know, with the multi-asset index, we actually see about 4% as well. But there's one crucial difference, right? You've got to remember the S&P, it's got a, it's like a, like a car with a big engine. It's got a lot of horsepower. So it has a volatility of 16. So think about that as a, as a, as a, Porsche 911, or it's got 300 horsepower. So you're going to get um, your 4% potentially on the S&P, but you've got to divide that by the volatility or the horsepower. And so four divided by 16, which is the, the, the historical vol in the S&P. So you're only getting about 4.4 in terms of your return for risk, right? So that's not really that great. A risk control index, you, you, might, you might get about 4% on average, but they have got a, a risk of about 5%. So you're getting about 0.8. So you're getting much, much more bang for your buck. So these risk control indices, they are designed to be smooth and they should hit you those singles much more consistently than the S&P, which we know is very volatile. And, and to your point, it's I, I love how you position that because it makes me feel good knowing that I'm kind of introducing people to this concept because a lot of times when I share with people, you know, and have that conversation of saying, okay, Tim, we don't know what to do anymore. We, we, we're worried about the market. We've been on a, they either identify the fact that it's been a nice bull run and it's going to come to an end at some point, yeah. or sometimes people get too sucked into chasing the yields. They get, they get too sucked into that. They drink the Kool-Aid and they're like, you know, then all of a sudden I kind of have to bring them back to reality a little bit and saying, well, okay, what, let me play devil's advocate. What happens to your account if we do not have this average annual return again in the future. Oh, I, yeah. And by the way, you're also taking money out for your RMDs. So talk about that. If you do, you made a comment just a second ago, Lawrence, and I like that when you mentioned the multi-asset in, index, just kind of break that down a little bit, just for the fact of what, what kind of goes into that and, and how that provides that almost true diversification inside of that index, yeah. as opposed to the volatility ups and downs of the S&P, for example. Sure. So, you know what I would say, the average multi-asset index today, what they'll typically do is take up to 10 ETFs and they might take, you know, the S&P 500, NASDAQ, they'll take emerging markets, IFA, you know, maybe Japan. They'll throw in potentially some bonds from those regions as well. They might throw in gold, might have a little bit of real estate, might have some commodities. So what you essentially see is, you know, it's very diverse. Mm -hmm. If you think about finance, what's one of the, the, the real truisms in finance? Diversification is the only free lunch. So you really want to be diversified. So that's what they do. Step one, 
Step two is they allocate to kind of give you the optimal returns whilst keeping your risk at a certain level. So that's how they allocate. And then there's this sort of risk control feature, which is really a buffer feature. It just aims to smooth the returns. So that's what they do. And, you know, we think about them as like hitting like singles. They are not never going to get you the 30, 40, 50% return in a year or over two years, but they're very consistent and they just kind of consistently hit you those singles. But also what happens if markets become choppy, then they really cushion you on the downside. Mm -hmm. So I'll give you an example. In March 2020, you saw the S&P down about 34%. Mm -hmm. On average, the, the whole risk control families, they fell about 10%. So, you know, at that point, you were doing a lot better. You don't have to worry about sequence of losses. You know, if you had, if you had just bought an annuity in the last couple of months, they, they have a lot that they only have like 10% to go back to get you in the money, whereas the S&P, you know, at 30% has a long way to go. So that's their, their ability just to provide those sort of singles-like returns. I like it. And, 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 I, and I love your analogy of using baseball terms because unfortunately they're having a lockout right now. So they should be in spring training reporting, but we're not there yet. So at least we can bring in baseball a little bit in our conversation here. Exactly. <laughs> but I, I like what you said too, a while ago about March of 2020, because when that happened, um, of course, you know, we reached out to our clients and provided some little bit of you know, communication with them. But I had one client in particular who sent me a text and said, do I need to get out of the market? And it was my wife, Rhonda. Wow. <laughs> she's, she's a nurse. She's working that day. She was on the shift. She heard about the market going down. I'm like, honey, no, you're fine. Just go back to work. Everything will be just fine. But, but, but you're exactly right. It was very interesting to see, you know, and to your point, when you see a market go down by 30% or anything, it goes down by 30%. Far too many consumers get sucked into the average rate of return. And they're in their minds, well, if it goes down 30 and comes back up 30, I'm at zero but we know that it actually takes 43% to, to break even. So you have to have that exactly. higher growth. It, it, it's so good to have that you know, diversification, like you said, Lawrence, where it kind of helps kind of ease the ebbs and flows of the markets whenever that happens. Because look what's happening right now with, with this whole Russia and Ukraine thing. I mean, we have so many unknowns and what ifs, but it can negatively impact our, our, our retirement accounts. Yeah, exactly. And I think that's why you want to be diverse all the time. And you know, it's hard to know where returns are going to come from. So just be diverse and you should just hit those singles. So, you know, when we think about, and I, and I want to touch on this with you as well, because you and I understand this, but I think it'll truly help listeners hear this coming from, from you, you know, the, the architect and designer and the, and the analyzer of all these indexes. Why is it so important for people to understand that transition from, getting away from that emotional asset. Well, Tim, I had this, this mutual fund and I've had this, these stocks for so long. They did so well to, to get me to retirement. And now I'm walking them through the transition of coming down the other side of the mountain known as the distribution phase. Talk about that element, like you just said before, Lawrence, the diversification, why it is so important for us to explore, understand having a product where we are sheltered from the downside, but still gives us the opportunity for the upside. Yeah, exactly. So I want to, to answer that question. I want to go back to something that you said. You said, we always see these warnings, past performance is not an indicator of future performance, right? So that holds true. So, you know, we tend to fall in love with a certain stock and it does very well for us. But if you think about it, if you think about a global stock market or even a certain stocks, you know, the S&P is not always the highest returning stock market in the world every year right? It switches around. Maybe it might be a Norwegian stock or a Chinese stock or, you know, somewhere, somewhere from Africa. You just don't know. So, you know, you, what you really need to be doing is be diverse and find sensible ways to think about keeping your portfolio, you know, robust. And what does that mean? It means thinking about different kinds of factors. So maybe you want to have some value investing. Maybe you want some quality stocks. Maybe you want some with a little bit of momentum. So you want to sprinkle it with what's called different factors. And you also want to sprinkle it with different regions. So maybe you want some stocks from Australia, New Zealand, um, Latin America, and Europe, because you just don't know. So that's what we advocate, being diverse. And especially now, right? The S&P has had a fantastic last 10 years. Is it going to have a fantastic next 10 years? 
I don't know, but let's also think about that, right? So for the S and P to go up another thirteen or fourteen percent annualized, you know, you're going to have to have Apple go to six trillion dollar market cap. You're going to have to have Tesla to go to almost two billion. You know, the Tesla PE is three four hundred, right? So can that really happen? I mean, maybe it can. Yeah. But maybe it's not going to happen, and maybe it makes sense to buy stocks from other regions. So that's why we think be diversified, and that's actually one of the benefits of what all these risk control indices do. Because now, as I was saying, there's 170 in the market. So if you like the S and P, you know you, you can keep an allocation, make it 20 percent, right? Don't right. make it 100 percent, and then you can fill that other 80 percent with other stocks, other regions, right? Absolutely. Talk to about this too. This is something we've not talked about yet, but one of the things that that drew me in to being so excited about having access to the index standard was the fact of how you and your team go through like a, almost like a grading scale per se, the, the gold, the silver, I think there's platinum, different things. Talk about that as far as, you know, how you categorize the indexes and the gradient, and then how often you, you, you refer back to, to the grade as things change from, from, Yes. quarter to quarter per se. Sure. So when we're looking at an index, just like JD Powers, they look at that car. Mm -hmm. We look at each index and we want to give it a rating. Mm -hmm. So we have a scale that goes from platinum being the best, then gold, silver, copper, and then our two bottom categories on neutral and watch. And what we do is we really compare each index to a similar group. So it's like comparing an SUV to an SUV. We always compare an SUV to an SUV. We don't compare an SUV to a sedan. That's point number one. And then what we do is we really want to look at each index and assess how, it, how it's going to do and how is it being constructed. So let me give you some insight into what we think about. We think about the complexity. How many parameters does that index have? Is it independently cal calculated? Is it diverse? Does it have one single stock that it's exposed to? Does it have one big sector or one country? That's a risk because we want to be diverse. We look at the calculation agent. We look at how long the index has been live. So these are some of the, the factors that we'll look at, and we call those transparency and robustness factors. We also bring in our forecast because we want to have a little bit of a forward-looking view. And then the remaining um, scores, we actually look at a lot of performance stats we'll look at the quality of the returns. We'll look at the drawdowns. We'll look at the volatility and we'll look at the efficiency ratios, things like the sharp ratio. So we use about 35 metrics to score each index. We score each ind index out of a hundred and then we categorize it into its category such as platinum, gold or silver and so on. And then how often do you go back and look at the 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 numbers and, and the algorithms and, and then rescore them and again or regrade them, I should say? How often do you we that? do this every month? So every we're month. always wow. constantly evaluating each index. And then you know we're picking up new information. And what we see, Tim, just for your information, we see about 15% a month of the scores will change. So it's very slow and gradual changes that index is either doing better or doing worse. Gotcha. Well, that's good to know because that's that's something that is, as far as you know, whenever I, whenever I sit down with a client, I'm explaining to them, you know, how it's so important. Like we said, like we said before, to have that element of true diversification. Once we've realized that that's important with the overall plan, especially when it comes to income planning, now we peel it back a layer, you know, deeper into the conversation. Say, okay, now let's go find that index that provides exactly what you're looking for. We're looking for accumulation. We're looking for income. When do we need income? Are we looking for legacy dollars? So, so having access to that analysis, Lawrence, is so huge. So, I, I man, I can't even begin to thank you and your team for for all that you do to to run those numbers and sift through 350 pages in an index. God bless you, my friend. I don't know how you do that, brother. You must love what you do. <laughs> I, I love indices and I, I love looking at them and I've been doing it for a long time. And we, we have a great team of a lot of uh, smart people who help us out. So it's, our, you know, it's, it's, we actually love it. So it, it's, it's good fun to see this, all this innovation that's happening in the industry at the moment. Very cool. So, so because you love what you do, you and I are in the same boat because here we are in the middle of the afternoon having a great conversation, but we're not really quote unquote working because we're doing what, what our passion lies and, and doing what we love to do. 
Exactly. <laughs> Love it. Lawrence, I can't begin to thank you enough, my friend, for carving time out of your schedule. It has been an honor, um, you know, getting to know you up to this point, seeing you at the event last week. And thank you so much for carving time out of your schedule to join me and share this information with me today. Tim, it's my real pleasure. And I hope we could do it again sometime. We certainly will, my friend. I appreciate it, Lawrence. Thank you. Thank you. So when you would like to see how this strategy that Lawrence and I were talking about, how it can protect your hard-earned savings while also having an opportunity to, partic to participate in these indexes that provide you know, account value growth, give me a call. You can reach me at 309-291-0491 and let's have that no obligation conversation. So thanks so much for stopping by and we'll see you again soon. Take care. Thank you for listening to Whistler While You Retire. Click the subscribe button below to be notified when new episodes become available. The information covered and posted represents the views and opinions of the guest and does not necessarily represent the views or opinions of the Whistler Agency. The content has been made available for informational and educational purposes only. The content is not intended to be a substitute for professional investing advice. Always seek the advice of your financial advisor or other qualified financial service provider with any questions you may have regarding your investment planning. Investment advisory and financial planning services offered through Simplicity Wealth LLC, an SEC-registered investment advisor. Insurance, consulting, and education services offered through the Whistler Agency. The Whistler Agency is a separate and unaffiliated entity from Simplicity Wealth LLC. This podcast is designed to provide general information on the subjects covered. Pursuant to IRS Circular 230, it is not intended to provide specific legal or tax advice and cannot be used to avoid penalties or to promote, market, or recommend any tax plan or arrangement. For insurance products discussed, guarantees are backed by the financial strength and claims-paying ability of the issuing insurance company.